we like to um, start those conversations at a at a pretty high level so that it's this a little bit for everyone. And uh, I think what would be really interesting would be to start with a general level set around um, the ecosystem and maybe starting with this concept of the modern data stack, uh, which has been around for uh, you know a little while now, but has really been going mainstream over the last couple of years. Uh, would I mean maybe Tristan, maybe starting with you, do you, you want to uh, take a crack at defining what that is for you know the highest highest level uh, possible to make this approachable? Yeah, I, I'll talk about it from our perspective, but I, I and I'm actually interested, Jeremiah, to hear how how much your answer differs from mine. Um, when when we talk about the modern data stack, we think about um, what's really four layers. So there's data ingestion, there's the data warehouse, there's data transformation, or like taking all that raw data and like turning it into something valuable, and then there's data analysis. Um, which could be BI or uh, notebooks or whatever. Um, but that those set of technologies have really been um, completely rebuilt, I think, over the past seven years. Really, it was like the introduction of Amazon Redshift with, uh, in, in 2013 that sparked kind of a rewrite of all of the products in that space. And now you, you know, in that time frame, you had uh, Looker, get founded and be sold to Google, you have five trend, you have like a, a whole set of products at, at every layer of, of that stack. And they're um, primarily, but not exclusively used for descriptive statistics, like classic business intelligence, like what is going on in my company today. Um, and I think the thing that I'm really curious about, Jeremiah, is that, is that do you use that word in the, 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 the modern data stack in the same way that I'm describing or do you think about yourselves as a, a part of a different version of that? It's a, that's a great question. I think, uh, to be honest with you, kind of selfishly, I think one of the things I'm very excited about this conversation is uh, you and I are sort of swimming in uh, sort of adjacent lanes of the same pool, but we're not necessarily doing the same stroke or, or with the same objective. And so uh, there are many things that you just said that absolutely come to mind for me, but I actually do think about it slightly differently. I think uh, what you just described, I completely agree, is, is the stack piece of it. And, and what I'm very focused on is probably the, the modern piece of it and what that's come to mean as a, as a differentiation. Um, and the two, the two are both critical. I'm not trying to say like one over the other. So I fully agree there's this, there's this layered thing, this, this data stack that, that's emerged. But to me, when I think about what makes it modern versus what it used to be is this uh, is a couple of sort of competing uh, uh, tensions or frictions. One of them is a set of standardizations, mostly in, in our world, you know, in the Pi data world and in the open source world, data science and machine learning. Um, but, uh, but in addition, we see this like vast experimentation. And so we see these like, this like proliferation of edge cases and uh, exploratory analyses. And I think that one of the things that links this all into a cohesive modern data stack is the tooling that allows uh, someone who you know, simply wants to take a very specific data extract and run some uh, cutting edge or, or just invented on the spot algorithm on it can do that in a way that integrates natively with their entire company's data backbone all the way back to the ingestion. And so it's the, it's the idea that the layers of this stack that Tristan just described are no longer siloed, but have actually embraced a set of interfaces or interoperative standards that have allowed people to participate without only existing in, just for example, the BI layer. You know, if we think back to BI tools, say five, certainly 10 years ago, you would sort of beg for a CSV and God help you if the data, if the, if the insight you weren't, if the insight you were looking for was not in that CSV, you, you're sort of screwed. Uh, but now thanks to, you know, great tooling and, and, and insight and standardization and, and and education and communication, that person is now empowered to actually potentially go directly into the data warehouse if, if desirable or, or interface with the folks who can provide that. So to me, I echo the layers and I think also about the way that they actually very smoothly work together. And, and to double click on this is, is when you mentioned parallel universes is, is one way of thinking about it that you basically in that, in that data world or ecosystem, you have, you have two families, I guess, or two categories. One is the world of 
analytics, uh, meaning BI, where you have this stack, where indeed you have the five trends of the world and where George um, speak at this event, uh, you know, a couple of events ago, and then the world of data warehouses. And then after the data warehouse, you have the, you know, the lookers of the world. So that's one world. And then another world is the world more of like, uh, you know, operational transactional data, uh, in particular machine learning and AI driven applications that starts with a data lake and has a different type of workflow. Is that, is it, is that fair? Is that what you guys see? I, I, yeah. Sure, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I disagree with you there, Matt, although I, I, it's been helpful at Prefect to actually draw the lines in a slightly different place. So maybe I'll talk about that. So I'm, I'm not sure if I disagree with the, with the landscape you just outlined, but I'll, I'll say just how we think about it. We, we found it instructive to think about uh, data engineering uh, centric workflows versus data science centric workflows. And, and immediately that's sort of a controversial, just broad brush to, to paint with. So what we mean by that is we mean as, for lack of a, for lack of a more general, as pipelines are built or as, as tooling is built or as workflows are built, is the principal item of interest the status of the job? Did it succeed or fail? Or is the principal item of interest data being transformed through the pipeline? We tend to think of the data transformations as data science focused, and we tend to think of the state things as data engineering focused. The reason that's a bit controversial is that ETL in many forms is therefore a data science centric activity in that philosophy of the world. But nonetheless, we found this a really useful way to categorize software tooling and who consumes it and for what purpose. So I won't swear that it's universally true, but that is how we sort of separate. So when we think about uh, BI tooling, uh, typically we're dealing with data transformations and we put that in the data science or perhaps we could say the analytic world. When we think about uh, orchestration or we think about um, uh, automation, often we're dealing with the status of something or the state of that thing. And we put that in the data engineering world. The, the line that we draw there is uh, and, and I don't know that we like spend a ton of time thinking about this, but but uh, I think it's kind of implicit in, in a lot of what we do um, is uh, about the the real timey requirements of what you're doing. And so so there's there's a lot of data science that's done internally, where like you're doing predictive analyses that you know the data latency can be a, a day. Or, or it can be like last quarter's data is fine. Um, and those data science workloads are often run on the exact same stack that I was talking about before. But the minute that you're like serving uh, recommendations in a public facing application and you need a hundred millisecond or less response time, like that is a, is a very different thing. Um, so th that that's kind of how we slice, slice. you know, today the DBT focused stack uh, can do that former thing and it can do it extremely well. Uh, we don't even attempt to think about that latter problem. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's different, different I, ways of clustering it. Yeah. I, I think not only is that so interesting, but Matt, you're probably the person most responsible for making people have to draw these lines because you've, you know, you put out this... <laughs> map with thousands of companies on it and trying to categorize them. I mean, I, I really, I, I, I think if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 different, you know, <laughs> splits of that, of that landscape. I, I really are you suggesting that reality doesn't actually lend itself to little boxes? <laughs> um, I'm saying it might be more than two dimensions at play. <laughs> Um, so to, to continue making this, um, you know, approachable for, for, for a bunch of um, uh, folks that like at different sort of levels of, of depth in that, in that space, um, could, could one of you take a, a crack at um, just at a high level of, on data warehouses, uh, because it's, you know, it's been the, the year of snowflake and, and a lot of the excitement around that modern data stack is, is really around uh, data warehouses, does, you know, does, uh, could one of you do like the, you know, two minutes on why it's a big deal, why it's Snowflake a big deal, why it's BigQuery a big deal, uh, and how that has changed things. I just gave a, a presentation on this. And I, this is like a topic that I, I love so much um, because the, the data warehouse, so uh, for the folks uh, watching this, I am not a data engineer. I am not a data scientist. My uh, career history is a data analyst. And so SQL is my you know, second language. Um, 
And uh, up until the release of Amazon Redshift in 2013, uh, I was, I didn't work at a large company that had a Teradata license or a Netiza a box in my, you know, the server cabinet somewhere. Um, and, you know, there certainly were a small number of companies who paid very high license fees for those products and they, they had great experiences. Um, but most of us were using, you know, transactional databases to do analytic workloads and that does not work very well. Um, there might be a large number of people who have tried to like write an analysis on MySQL and like found that that's like not a wonderful experience. Um, and so Amazon Redshift in 2013 for the first time released an OLAP database, a, a database designed for large scale query processing that you could purchase for $160 a month. So like everyone could use it for the first time. And that like literally fundamentally changed how you thought about doing analytics at every company that did not previously have a, a, a vertical license. Um, th that's my, you know, I, I know that that's a technology centric answer to that question, but like it's the same way that like EC2 or S3 has changed the way that we think about not just like building applications, but like then building startups around those applications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe uh, one more word on like, you know, elasticity, what's, what's fundamentally different other than the price and what, you know, what, what is a big advantage? Yeah, so it, it like addresses the low end of the market in terms of price, but then like you can just start there and you can just stay there forever. There's no, there's no too big. Yeah, and, and do you, do you wanna also, um, again, for, for, for folks, I explain the difference between a data warehouse and a data lake? Jeremiah, do you want to do that one, or do you want me to do it? Uh, what, you want to continue? I'll. <laughs> I'm just, I'm I'm listening to you here. Yeah. So uh, a data lake uh, is a bunch of files in some particular file format. It can be you know any one of a large number of formats, including like CSV, uh, that is just shoved into a, a object store, um, and then you can take a compute engine and run. Uh, data processing on top of that that uh, object store. Um, that, you know, a, a data warehouse ultimately is the same. Like if you want to describe what Snowflake is, like Snowflake is also that, but Snowflake is a very tightly coupled uh, way of doing the file storage, of doing the indexing, of doing the processing. And so it is very, very good at certain types of data processing use cases. Um, I would say that probably... Uh, the, you know, where we are today, the data lake can kind of do anything, um, but it also probably takes more work to do anything. Whereas the data warehouse is, has a more constrained set of use cases, but it is much easier to get up and running for those constrained set of, of use cases. I, I think there's an analogy to be made uh, although it's a, it's a dicey one because we're already in sort of database land, but I think there's an analogy to be made with some of the trade-offs of the NoSQL database or SQL database where, you know, folks who have done it before would say like, you're going to have a schema. It's just a question of whether you define it upfront or you figure it out later. And I think the data lake emerged as a way to defer, you know, as a consequence of what Tristan just said, be because most classic data warehouse providers require you to specify or at least know how you're going to access your data. Now, thankfully, not quite as tightly as maybe a transaction database, but you still have to know how you're gonna access it, how you're gonna store it. The data lake is sort of a way to say, oh, we'll check it over there, we'll figure it out later. But as we all know, at some point you have to standardize your access to the data. It's really a question of when, I think, not if you do that. Great. All right, well, that's a great level set. Um, so I'd love to uh, spend a bit more time uh, separately on like on, on I guess each of you and, and what you guys are doing um, so that uh, folks under, understand. So maybe Tristan, starting with you, um, maybe talk about, um, you know, DBT and I guess the evolution of ETL to ELT and where, where that fits in in a, in a data warehouse centric world. Yeah, so um, the, the history and, and I didn't, personally participated in a lot of the like pre pre version of this, but um, the, uh, the, the history of, of data processing in data warehouses that you, you tried to do as much of the data processing 
before the data got to the warehouse as, as possible. Um, data warehouses were constrained, expensive. Like if, if you wanted uh, another Natiza box, you like order it a month ahead and you know, it gets shipped to your environment. So it, you know, it's, it's, it's not elastic. Um, and so um, once you have infinitely scalable compute and storage inside the data warehouse, and this is like a, a very, it seems small, but uh, it is actually, I think a very important point. Once you have SQL that can actually describe all of the things that you might want to do, which only actually happened between 2008 and 2012, like the specifically the window function standard as a part of the SQL 2008 revision um, made it such that you could now express like all the stuff you wanted to do in SQL. And so what's happening now or over the past you know, five or so years, the, the transformation step now happens inside the data warehouse and it happens in SQL. And because of that, it is now accessible to a dramatically larger number of people. You no longer have to have a PhD in parallel computing to like participate in this process, which is ultimately like the distillation of knowledge at your company. You know, you, you take all this raw data and you transform it into something that actually has business meaning. And if you lock that up behind only people that have degrees in computer science, it's a fairly small group of humans. And, what, and in layman's term, what, what is it actually a transformation? What, what are some examples of operations that one does? Yeah, um, the, the one that I uh, always like to talk about is uh, we have uh, a self-service SaaS product. Uh, we use Stripe for our payment processing. Stripe gives us invoices. The invoices have start date and end dates. Um, but if you just add up all of the invoice totals for a given month, you don't actually get monthly recurring revenue. In order to get monthly recurring revenue, you have to take your invoices and amortize them over the period that they are for. So if you have an annual subscriber, you need to recognize that revenue over the course of 12 months. And so a data transformation is, and it's actually like reasonably a complicated one, is to take your invoices and amortize them into monthly revenues such that you can just have this table that every month you just add up the, the numbers and that that's, gives you your monthly recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. So a, a big part of the, or like a big theme here is the, the rise of the data analyst, as you, as you mentioned. Um, what, is a, what, what is a data analyst uh, compared to, you know, a data scientist or a data engineer? What, what should they be able to do and how technical are they? I, I yeah, th uh, that is, that is the question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> That's a complicated question. Yeah. Um, I, here's my personal opinion. I don't throw tomatoes because I know that everybody has their own thoughts on this topic. But um, I think that a data analyst is somebody who answers business questions with data. And they have a, they, they frequently will have uh, a, a business or econ degree. They like are interested in solving business problems, but they're also not afraid of technology. And they often have learned all the technologies that are required to do a good job of answering those questions, whether that's, you know, sometimes Excel, sometimes SQL, sometimes Python or R, um, but they don't self-identify as technologists. They learn technology in the service of answering these business questions. Mm -hmm. And, um, I like that definition. <laughs> it, it, is a, it is a great uh, definition. And they, um, so they need to know SQL, they need to know what a little bit of Python. Uh, so if, if you want to take me as a representative, I know SQL very well. I know Python well enough that when I have a, a predictive problem that I run into, I can hack my way there. Um, but I could not build a production application in Python. And I think that's reasonably representative. Yeah. 
And maybe a word on DBT and then we'll switch to, to Jeremiah. Um, so the, the, is, is, is it correct that the philosophy of DBT, so which is a you know very successful open source project, maybe you can touch upon a little bit of the history here, um, is the underlying philosophy uh, to help data analysts think like software engineer, is that correct? Um, Meaning empowering them? Yes, that is, that is completely true. Um, I think that what we are really trying to do is um, widen the circle of people at an organization who can participate in this, this process, the process of creating new knowledge. Um, we're we're um, trying to empower the data analysts to be first-class owners of that, that process, as opposed to you know, the, the pre previous experience was, you know, I'm doing some analysis and then, oh crap, I realized that I need some new data set and I need to file a ticket with somebody in data engineering who will, you know, eventually put it on their roadmap and get back to me when they can. Um, and, and that is like the, the death of a, the data analyst as like a productive member of, of your team uh, they will get frustrated. They will leave. They 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 don't have great career paths. All of these like negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, just yeah, word on, on DBT. So you you guys started in twenty sixteen. We so uh, Fishtown Analytics, my company that is the the maintainers of DBT. Um, we started as a consulting business, and DBT was the tool that I wanted to be able to do this work. Um, and I honestly didn't know how many data analysts wanted to work like software engineers. Um, and, and it turns out that over time, we've built this community of over 8,000 people today who uh, you know, ha have bought into this as like the way that they want their careers to look. And so that's, that spawned a, a software offering uh, originally I thought that it was just going to be me and a couple other folks who were using this thing. Yeah. And by the way, fast forward to today, uh, congratulations on announcing a series B that closed like three months after the series A, uh, I know. Which, you know, which is a, a testament to the uh, like a raw excitement about what, what you guys have been, uh, have been it's, building. It's been a very interesting year for us. There's a lot happening. And then, Jeremiah, awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Jeremiah, that's, that's a little bit the, your story as well, right? Um, that you started building something for yourself and then at some point decided actually other folks may want to use that and it could be an open source project. Is that is that the story? Yeah, it, it's a version of it. And and I was just thinking that when you, when you were speaking, uh, one of the things that I believe so strongly, uh, forgetting the, the data side for a moment, but when we think about just startups or companies or what it is, is is solving a, a real problem and not an invented problem. And if I'm advising someone who's trying to start a company or something, so often you get pitched a solution, but if you asked people if they had that problem, I'm not sure they would recognize it. And so I think that one of the things certainly that we feel at Prefect and Tristan sounds very much like you did with DBT um, at Fishtown is we were solving a problem that and that you had that that I had. My background uh, is as a data scientist and as a machine learning researcher, and more specifically in risk management in the investing world. And I had a series of problems that were primarily related to a breadth of work. So across multi-asset portfolios, across many stakeholders, across, and uh, many of them were analytic. Some of them were not. Some of them were somewhat like boring and rote, and and you know straightforward and, and some of them were incredibly complicated and unproven and experimental and uh, Prefect was, a, was a, you know, an attempt just for myself to solve those problems in a cohesive and, and unified way. Uh, and most importantly, because I, I mentioned sort of the PyData ecosystem earlier and I'm very much a, a believer in that, most importantly, it was a tool that would, that would allow me to continue to use the best tool for the job. In other words, I didn't want to replace the tools that I used as a data scientist. I mean, I've been using, I'm a contributor to Theano for those who are actually in the news recently, because I think uh, the PyMC3 folks are gonna sort of revitalize it, which I think is awesome. Um, but like, I've been doing this for a long time with, with amazing tools and I didn't want to replace those. I didn't want to rebuild them. I wanted to 
<laughs> make sure they were all doing what they were supposed to do at the right time. And that's where Prefect came from. It wasn't until a bunch of other folks I worked with were like, hey, we, we would use that. We would pay for that. That you know, the light bulb went off, and we and we went off to find the right way to deliver it. And and and, and a key answer to that is uh, open source as a way to d deliver, distribute, and collaborate on on software. But there's definitely an echo of that. Uh, it was a selfish problem, to be completely honest. Now, I I am not the person, right? I have an amazing team now at Prefect who has advanced this so far beyond what it was back then. Uh, that's not that's not me back then, that's just the initial impetus that, hey, there's a thing, it has a name, we can describe it, we can solve it, let's move forward with that. Great. So where do you sit in that overall ecosystem that we were talking about? I guess uh, maybe double click on the, the, the problem you're solving, what is, um, uh, you know, what, what is uh, workflow automation, what does scheduler do? Um, at a, at a, you know, at a, at a <clears throat> high level. Yeah, I think the, the principal problem that, that we solve, there's, there's, two, there's two aspects. There's a problem we solve, but before we can get there, let's just talk about sort of what it looks like to, to understand where this problem comes from. Um, people write code. They put that code into the world to do something, to take some action, to have some side effect or, or produce some result. And, uh, and you build enormously complex and beautiful applications as a consequence of putting all that together. Uh, but making sure that that happens at the right time, in the right order, with the right dependencies, in the right environment, in the right cluster, I mean, on and on and on and on, is a complicated problem. And often we refer to that as an orchestration problem. And just to like hammer at home, I think it's a very on the nose uh, metaphor for it. But you think of a, an orchestra, right? The orchestra is a collection of individuals who are playing music. There's a composer, there's an arranger, there's a musician, there's a conductor. And again, we have this idea of everything needs to happen at the same time and same the right time, the right place, the right note, everything like that. Um, that is actually not the problem that we think we solve though, to be honest with you, because the idea of just running code at the right time in the right place, I mean, we can go back probably 40 or 50 years and find pieces of software that claim to do that with varying degrees of, of efficacy. Um, uh, we do do that with Prefect. We do automate workflows. We do automate code as a consequence of what we are trying to do. What we're actually trying to do is we're worried about the case where the auditorium is burning down or when the first violinist is sick, or when it's too hot in the room, or when uh, there's a pandemic and the audience can't attend. Uh, and this is, and, and, and what I'm describing is my, again, I mentioned I'm a risk manager, you know, for however many, one, two decades or whatever it's been. Um, the problem that I always had with my code was not getting it to run. That was easy enough. I would use it, I would write a script, I would use a, a great tool, I could do something like like BBT to make sure that I'm doing something with best practice or getting out there. My problem was actually when I would wake up in the morning and not know if an error had taken place. And I would spend hours trying to figure that out. Uh, today we work, we work with, with clients who have saved hours and hours and hours of time, not by writing a single line of code using Prefect, but because they log in and they look at a dashboard and they see red and green lights. And they just know, oh, we have to go, something needs to be restarted. We have to go figure something out, something broke. Um, so that idea, that's why we frequently describe our product as an insurance product is because we deliver value mainly when things go wrong. And, and this will sound crazy maybe to say, but if everything goes the way one of our users expected it to go, they really don't need our product. It's a very weird like product positioning for us to, to, for us to have that belief. If things work the way our users expect, they don't need our product. And again, the insurance metaphor is, uh, is very useful there. And so we've named this problem the negative engineering problem because it's not about what you're trying to achieve it's about all the defensive work you have to do to make sure that it actually took place, in fact, took place. And how do you uh, compare and contrast this versus, um, you know, Airflow and, and other uh, products in the, the space? You had a, a very um, uh, well-written and, 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 and uh, you know, successful post on the, on the topic, curious about the, how you, how you uh, position. Jeremiah, how does it feel to be in a category with Airflow where everybody always wants to know how you compare versus Airflow? We, we get this question uh, a lot, actually. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a funny, it's a funny question to get because I am a PMC of yeah. Airflow and I gave many years of my life to building Airflow. And if I were able to do the things that Prefect does in Airflow, I would have. Uh, so the funniest part about getting that question so often, because Tristan, you're 100% right, the funniest part about getting the question so often is that Prefect was actually developed 
very literally to do things that I was unable to achieve with airflow, right? I was supposed to go off in a different way. And so uh, now it happens that our functionality is a superset of, of Airflow's functionality. And so there are many things that we're actually very pleasantly surprised to discover a lot of people are like, oh, Airflow's too hard, we're gonna use Prefect instead, or however they show up at, at Prefect. But the primary set of use cases that we originally started with were to borrow those data engineering metaphors that are expressed in Airflow and actually deliver them to data scientists like myself, who otherwise lived in a world where there was no concept of a retry. There was no concept of, you know, state-based dependency or anything like that. Um, so we could, I mean, we've written this, this, this blog post, it's called, it's called Why Not Airflow? It's, you know, why, why would you as a data scientist or someone using a modern data stack not choose to use this uh, well-known tool that I gave a few years of my life to build? Uh, and I can refer folks there for the answers, but in all honesty, uh, it's a very pleasant surprise to have to answer that question because our, our sort of raison d'etre is all about uh, doing a whole different class of things around data science, machine learning, uh, analytical workloads. Great. All right, as we, as we start getting um, questions from the audience, I wanna highlight some and then I'll come back. Um, but Jack, do you wanna, do you want to read the, that that question? Or yeah. That? Yeah, absolutely. Um, camera if you want. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm back. Um, so we have a great question from uh, Eric, uh, who's actually a speaker at our, our code-driven event uh, several months ago. So uh, his question is: What do you think is the biggest thing data engineers, scientists, analysts waste time on, and where there's an opportunity to build tools to address that? All right, may I, may I jump in? Is that, is that an open question? Yeah, by all means. Is that directed anyway? So I, I mentioned this, this earlier, um, but I'm more focused on the case where the theater's burning down. And the reason we're focused there is if you imagine saving somebody one hour, uh, and Eric, I think, I think Eric in particular will, will, will know this well. So this, this may be my answer is directed at others who may have the same question than, than him in particular. But um, if you imagine saving someone one hour, orchestrating something, just getting that code to run, versus saving a team one hour in a production crisis incident, the leverage of that uh, hour, it's the same hour, but the leverage, the impact, the emotional burden, the fact that revenue's at risk versus you know, just the fact that you got stuff to go is so wildly different. Um, that one of the reasons we focus there is that even if we only make a small impact, even if we only save that one hour, the compounded effect through an organization of, of bringing, uh, we, we call it time to error, but perhaps that's not meaningful. Uh, outside of Prefect, but by reducing that time to error, that time to discovery, and just, I mean, so much of our product is around that one moment. And if, and if you log in, you see a bunch of green lights, like, see you later. You shouldn't be using our product right now. We have no, nothing interesting for you, potentially. My, my team probably is angry that I said that, but it's sort of part of how we design it. Um, but if you come in and there's, and something is wrong, and it's, it's something that's important to you, our job is to deliver that information as quickly and concisely as possible, because the number one frustration that I have certainly felt in many others is, oh God, something failed, but the cluster tore down the node and the logs weren't properly archived and I actually can't find out what it was and I can't recreate it and I don't know when it happened and I don't. And so it's really cutting down that at that moment of maximum anxiety, delivering, delivering the confidence and clarity that we can is where we think we have the greatest leverage as a product, even though it may not be the single uh, greatest waste of time of any individual. This is an interesting distinction. And again, from our insurance mindset. I, I'm glad you went first because I had to, I like wanted to think about my answer. Um, the uh, I so the data analyst is a highly cross-functional role. They have essentially no organizational power. They uh, exist to uh, dive deeply into uh, questions, and even that they like need to do in a cross-functional way and get get support from you know technical folks to get data sets and all this stuff. Um, and so the the biggest problem in their workflow is getting blocked. It's like, I have a thing on my to-do list and I can't make forward progress on it. And there's a million ways to get blocked as a data analyst. Like the, the one that we're trying to uh, really focus on is, is the, the technical one, like being able to own the, the technology part from beginning to end. But, you know, even once you wholly eliminate that, you, you know, have classes of problems like, well, I, I need to 
add instrumentation or I need to like actually like make business process changes as a result of the thing that I already told you last month that like, I, you know, until we do that thing, then none of my other work really matters. Or, so um, I, I think that data analysts stay blocked. Like, like if you take a, a team uh, at a, at a like very good, like the data forward organization, a team of 20 data analysts, my guess is that they spend 50% of their time blocked. I can attest to that. <laughs> Certainly. Cool. All right. So let, let me um, switch to another topic and then we'll take questions. Like we have uh, like over 100, uh, 200 uh, folks in attendance. So I want to I wanna leave uh, plenty of time for, for questions. But uh, one topic I wanted to be sure we, we touch upon is um, building an open source company. Uh, so both of you are building your companies uh, with a, a very strong open source component and a commercial product on top. How do you, how, I guess, how does that work? And how do you think about uh, what needs to be in the open source and what needs to be in the commercial product? Can I answer that first? Because my answer is going to be a non-answer. Um, uh, I, uh, we are still early. And I don't know. I, it's a very, very hard question. And I think that uh, it is like something that the, you know, the entire B2B software in industry has like embraced open source as like this wonderful uh, formula. But, but the last generation of open source companies used a particular model. And in a lot of ways, I think the industry has said like, no, we're looking for, for new models. Um, so we have certainly have things that we are doing and that we're uh, testing out, but we are still very early as a company. The thing, Jeremiah, that I'm interested in hearing from you, um, you, I heard you on a podcast, uh, uh, Invest Like the Best. You talked about this insurance concept and I, I love it. It's like been very instructive in, in my own thinking. I'm curious how uncertain do you know when you presented that it felt like you were just like i know all the answers like we've 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 answered this monetization question um my guess is that that's probably not as as true as that is that, is that i true? yeah i i i think uh with, without without saying the opposite of what you just said what i think that you are hearing is we've spent a lot of time we spent a lot of time thinking about exactly this question that matt just answered now I'll, I'll give you what we'll what I think our, our, our answer is. But one of the reasons we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about it is coming from a non-traditional place. And, and I mean, look, there's a lot of overlaps between uh, the story Tristan stole and the story that, that I'm about to tell, although we have gone in different directions. I'm not trying to say that we're, we're mirror images of each other here. Um, but coming from a non-traditional place outside Silicon Valley, there's, there's all these things where we, we just, I think we thought about things in a little bit of a, of a different way. and. Um, one of the reasons, as I mentioned, that we started uh, a company and, and even introduced the open source product is we just had this like, like, like knocking on the door of product market fit. And so we spent a lot of the time uh, when we were a seed stage company uh, building the company that we wanted to have in a few years and investing in processes and business operations and leadership training and uh, management frameworks and and these things that sound kind of ridiculous. And I've had plenty of people tell me that we were ridiculous to to uh, pursue them at that time. But I think what you were hearing from me, Tristan, in that moment is uh, I have a, a decision making framework that I that I really like, which allows me to have great confidence in things under limited information sets. And this is this is again, I'm, I'm uh, this is a skill set that I developed principally as a risk manager, where my job was to make decisions about extremely unlikely and uncertain information sets. And one of the things that I've tried to do with Prefect is take some of that philosophy and those ideas into how we steer our company. And so uh, uh, what you were hearing, I think in the podcast is like, no, I don't claim to have all the answers by, by any means. Um, what I have is, what's the phrase? Um, strong beliefs weekly held, I think uh, is one version of it. Uh, we sort of codified that into, into how we can move forward and how we can, you know, one of the principles we have it's a, in our like set of standards is saying, I don't know. And if someone didn't say, I don't know frequently enough, that would be, that would be very disturbing to us at Prefect. That would mean that we hadn't tried enough things with some degree of conviction to learn that we were wrong and failed quickly. And so I think that's a little bit of, of what you were probably uh, hearing, hearing from me there. 
Um, as far as the split though, this is, this is a, you know, commercial and open source. Um, we didn't require our open source to be successful for our company to be successful. In fact, in that podcast, I think Patrick asked me at the end, uh, do you, it sounds great. Like, shouldn't everyone be open source? And I was like, God, no, uh, it's really hard. It's really, I mean, the, if you think about the number of successful companies that have actually iterated on this open source, the number is very, very, very small. And it's especially small relative to the denominator, which is much larger because the cost of, of entering that market is so low. Um, so I think that the book is yet to be written on the successful commercialization of open source. One of the things that we have tried to do at Prefect and we uh, admire extraordinarily what's, what's happening in the DBT world here is we've tried to use the fact that we seem to have built something people truly enjoy. And I think that's because it really solves a real problem that they really feel to create a flywheel that benefits all of our stakeholders so that our open source users can benefit from work we do for our uh, commercial customers. And in turn, our commercial customers, we know that they tend to come from the open source. That's their value discovery. And so we, we end up, and there's obviously more dimensions than that, but we end up with this symbiotic relationship, two separate businesses, but nonetheless intertwined. And we have to make sure that both of them are, uh, are healthy. And so while we don't require, well, at, at this point, to be honest with you, the, 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 the Prefect Open Source Project has taken off to such a degree that like, we do require it to be successful now. It is a huge part of our, of our company, what we do, but we didn't, we didn't require that from day one because our goal is to build a company and solve a problem. But is, is the idea that um, the commercial product should do something different um, as opposed to being a, for example, a managed version of the, of the open source product? So I, I have, I've been referring back to this podcast, which th th this podcast was only about this topic, if anybody is, is curious to sort of hear my opinions there. So I'm, I, I, as you can hear me saying there, I think that that is a bad business model. And I sort of, I'm on the record of that. And for a very simple reason, which is that a company that is solving a problem needs to find the correct way to express its knowledge and its solution to that problem. And running software literally cannot be, unless you are, unless you are a company that sells CPUs and, and there are public clouds for that, that is not the expression of that, of that drive. And so I think if you look at successful commercial open source companies, you will see that their products are not just managed versions of an open source product. They're truly adding some layer of something. The best ones are actually completely different products from their open source, such that uh, we, we like to think in, in our world of an engine in a car. We can have an amazing engine, but we can, we can spend all of our time building you know, a Ferrari. And if somebody just needs that engine and they want to drop it into whatever car they've built, that's amazing. That's great. And if somebody wants to like come over and get our seats and our steering wheel, we have that, we have that as well. Um, but if all we were doing was releasing a car and then having a slightly nicer car, like, man, we, we better be damn sure that people want, you know, the Chrome taken off the windows or, you know, whatever crazy little option they have. Uh, so, so uh, I think that if you, if you do not recognize what the actual problem that you can solve commercially versus the actual problem you can solve open source, if they're not sufficiently different, I think you end up in a place where you sort of have a perverse incentive to take advantage of your open source community or monetize them uh, in a brutal in a brutal way. And, and in a way that frankly, people aren't dumb, they, they, they realize this. And so the, the name of the game is, is transparently and openly and honestly to communicate what value you're able to deliver as a commercial entity uh, in addition to or, or next to what value you can deliver in an open source form. Great. All right, let, let's take one audience question and then I'll have more. All right, great. Let's see. We have a bunch of great questions in here. Um, let's do this one. So uh, Tristan, from this is from Ned. Um, do you have advice about using DBT with tools like LookML and KubeJS that also do in warehouse transformations but are geared towards the last mile of modeling for analytics consumers. Uh, are there good ways to think about the boundaries between the two? Uh, I'll answer for LookML. I've not actually heard of KubeJS before and I am uh, saving that in my browser right now. Um, the uh, LookML does two things. Look, it, 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 there is a uh, batch-based transformation that happens before the analysis and then there's uh, analyze time uh, transformation. And DBT and Looker are used together all the time to very great effect. We're, we're Looker partners, like we ourselves internally use DBT plus Looker. Um, the, the part of LookML that does batch-based transformation 
um, is, is not the primary focus of their product. It's not like the core innovation that they have. Um, and so we use DBT to do all of our batch-based transformation. And then we use LookML to do all of the like analyze time work. Gotcha. Awesome, thank you. A bunch of good questions in the chat. So, like, maybe let's try some some more. For for example, from Bill, how do you feel about tools such as Gra uh, GraphQL to simplify and broaden the applicability of the data service that you publish? Uh, we expose a GraphQL API uh, over the over the uh, you know as as the Prefect API, and uh, it it can be great. It can also open the door to problems because in, in some ways you are exposing you know a, a great degree of flexibility we, we work with a company called Hasura uh, who we're big fans of to to build that um, but you can you can put people in a position on the one hand you can offer people look you want to sort you want to filter you want to query you can do whatever you want it's your data but on the other hand you're inviting people to query a data set that you may not have optimized for the access pattern that they have in mind and that can create some complexity and, and, and user frustration. And so what we've found is that it's fabulous for exploratory work uh, or ironically uh, well-defined queries, which is sort of the opposite of the purpose of GraphQL. Um, but increasingly we're now moving towards, still in GraphQL because we, we like the syntax, but increasingly we're moving to more tightly scoped uh, views of the data in order to make sure that we can deliver, you know, as we, as we start to allow, have people who are querying like millions and millions of items, we want to make sure that we're delivering the, the proper performance. And sometimes we have to sacrifice flexibility to get there. Okay. And another question I uh, like, and I was actually going to ask a uh, variation thereof, um, which is really about, uh, you know, the flip side of um, empowering data analysts and I guess the rise of automation, I guess, which is both things that like, you know, uh, you guys do. So the questions from Niall is, um, as data analysts are empowered to own more and more of the data journey, in what ways do you see the role of a data engineer changing? What will the engineer, engineering, uh, what will the engineering aligned members of a data team be doing? Will they, yeah. my question, will they be automated away or what happens? Uh, I do, I, I think that it, like, if you look at the history of uh, self-service, you never find technical folks who are just like, oh, I don't, no one needs me anymore. My skill set's useless. Um, I, I think that there are so many problems in this space that um, data engineers shouldn't want to be spending their days expressing business logic, like how do you amortize revenue across multiple periods? Um, they are technologists. They should want to be thinking about platforms and scalability and all of these like hard technical problems that uh, honestly like are underinvested in right now. Um, so I, I think that uh, you know, if, there's a, if there's a single piece of writing on this topic that I still think is gospel, um, there's a guy at Stitch Fix who wrote a blog post called Engineers Shouldn't Write ETL um, back in 2016. And I, I still think that that is the, the best point of view on this topic today. So before we take another audience question, I'd love to chat a little bit um, about, I guess, emerging trends, right? Like in the, in the space. So, uh, you know, the, the, the setup being what we've discussed so far, which is all right, this like the modern data stack and there's, you know, machine learning stack. And, you know, a lot of those things started in um, 2012, 2013, 2014, and have really accelerated over the last couple of years and they become mainstream. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, I guess, what are the cool kids like you guys are mean, doing? Um, what are they thinking about? So, you know, some of the themes around, you know, we, we talked about real time a little bit in streaming. It's something that, you know, people have been talking about it for a while. Is that, is that, is that happening now? Uh, you know, governance, uh, self-serving BI, like all those things. Like what, what are your, what are your like sort of favorite emerging topics? Tristan, you want to take that one? You want me, want no, me you do. Okay, it. sure. Uh, so first of all, no one's ever referred to us as cool kids before. So thank <laughs> you for that. That's great. Um, that's nice to hear. Uh, in one of the earlier uh, times we announced Prefix, I was like, well, you know, this is a hot new workflow manager. I was like, that's a phrase that's never been said before. So that's, it's great that we can like get people to, to feel that way. Um, 
uh, what do we see happening? So, so we're actually like uh, really, um, really thinking about this. We've been thinking about this all year, actually, because uh, uh, we thought that we were, you know, putting something into the world that was the next step towards the sort of machine learning data science world that I come from, that I feel is underserved from a, you know, production engineering standpoint, but has this amazing ecosystem of, of tooling. And so we got all these like happy users and happy customers. And then they brought us this new set of use cases where they're clearly heading from a, from a data analytics uh, standpoint. And it, it made us realize we've kind of pushed this like batch DAG static workflow probably as far as it can go, like from the old, from the YAML and then into Python and now with like flexible frames like Prefect. And like, now we have this class of use cases that involved like, serverless and runtime discovery and um, streaming, which is a very loaded word. And I echo what Tristan said earlier, I'm not necessarily talking about like millisecond latency streaming. I'm talking about purely event-driven, like runtime discovered needs to take actions um, uh, and, and dynamic edges. So uh, we, we introduced a feature about a year ago. It's mapping and to anyone in the analytics world like mapping is no big deal but for folks in the sort of orchestration world this is actually like a mind-blowing feature and it's by far the most popular feature of prefect and we can see that in our in our data and that's because it solves a real problem that i experienced with data science which i have a bunch of things i need to work with but i don't know about it until until runtime and so for about a year and a half this has been the most popular feature we've we've ever built turns out as soon as you introduce this form of dynamicism to people they're like oh well we could do all kinds of other cool things, recursive things. Uh, we can introduce cycles into our graph, which for DAG-based workflows is uh, forbidden. We can have sidecars, which is where something's happening while the graph continues to process. Again, in, in our sort of DAG-based world, that's uh, forbidden. And so what, what enables this is uh, by bringing an API into play. And so one of the things that we're super interested in is the degree to which APIs become a way to move that business logic of the workflow um, into a more central place and allow us to say, you know what, um, my workflow failed. I need to turn off its schedule. Sounds really simple. Like most of the stuff in the world is really, really hard. We use this, we monitor our own uptime with a prefect flow. So if we had, Cloudflare was like having all kinds of problems a couple of weeks ago, right? So it's a situation where like we failed to, we couldn't reach ourselves and we started posting an incident. But the problem is schedule kept running. This is on a segregated instance, obviously. So it was able to run even though the internet wasn't. Working. And uh, and we need to turn that off. But we had no way to do that because this this concept of like reaching through time and like turning off this like meta orchestration layer didn't exist. And so where we're working with our users now is on a class of use cases that have to do with like, yeah, we did the thing we wanted to do, but now there's this new world of meta dependencies that we want to uh, expose. And so for, for our point of view, and I am talking our book a little bit here, it's not so much the technologies they're bringing to bear. We've always worked with data scientists and machine learning people who are doing kind of crazy cool stuff. For us, it's about seeing how they want those tools to work together in a way that frankly, we didn't anticipate. And uh, starting really next quarter, we'll start to introduce the features to enable that. I have a really fast answer there. Something that I'm really excited about. The, um, the, the stack that we've been talking about this entire time is, tends to be used for analytics, to, tends to be used to like inspect data to make some human decision and then use humans to go out and like impact that decision in the world. Um, but there's an in, in increasingly, uh, there's a class of tools that takes the data that is in your data warehouse and pushes it back to operational systems. And I think that you will, as, as soon as that starts happening, you can automate the entire process and all of these technologies become, you know, the, the, the size of the opportunity, I don't know if it doubles or it 10 X's, but like uh, you're no longer just using it to make decisions. You're using it to actually like form the nervous system of your entire operating business. Yeah, if, if, this, if this modern data stack gels, then the compounded effect it can have by having this like fluidity of, of data can be extraordinary. I agree with that. You, you said something much better than what I said in a lot shorter time, Kristen. <laughs> so I'm gonna echo that. <laughs>
All right. Uh, so we we at the hour, uh, but we still have 157 people on this. Um, so you know, clearly uh, people are enjoying this conversation. Um, so what, what don't we take like one or two more questions from uh, the chat, and then you know, sort of give it 10 minutes, and then we'll wrap. Great. Sounds great. Matt, do you want to ask or you want me to? uh go ahead okay awesome so there's one from josh here um it says we're seeing a lot of recent focus on being able to manipulate data masking pii as a simple example in flight before it lands at the data warehouse or data lake even for a schema at read products do you see this as a trend that will continue to accelerate are there pressures to do so uh, are the pressures to do so purely regulatory or are there other factors Who do you want to take it? I can say some things. I'm not an expert. Yeah, go for it. Go for it, Tristan. Um, I, either. I, I think so. So one thing that I will say with authority is that if you land data in your warehouse, it is very hard to ever have it go away completely. Um, those landing zones then get ingested and taken all over the place, and then it it becomes a real challenge. Um, and so I. Really, I, I see the same thing that this uh, this question is asking in in real time, and uh, believe that that is going to be one of the most compelling things that you could possibly do before the data lands in the warehouse in the first place. Um, I think that exactly how one goes about doing that is not clear yet. I think that certainly there are very like uh, uh, you know engineering heavy ways to do this, but like the, the easy solution to this, I don't think by and large exists yet. Yep, Great. thank you. Jeremiah, anything to add there? Or... I, I can add a little bit just from the regulatory point of view. We, we deal with an enormous number of customers in the healthcare and financial services spaces. And so that data is regulated either for privacy or you know other, other concerns. Um, one of the ways that, that we approach this problem just as a business is we, we create the separation of where the data transformations take place and the fact that we operate only on uh, metadata. Uh, we, we, once a business is HIPAA compliant or, or, or compliant with some regulatory things, you can either play entirely in that sort of space and that becomes a very expensive on-prem deploy if you're a service provider uh, or you can't work with them at all. And so that's why we have this enormous effort to, to operate at a distance uh, exclusively on anonymized metadata. So we, we encounter this a lot. Uh, we, it's a very complicated problem. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Well, when I'll take the, the next one. There's so many good questions. So one question from Jill. We didn't ask that question. Right? Jill, no. um, no. can you speak to the balance between the value of data democratization and the importance of data reliability and governance, particularly for large enterprises. Philosophically, what parts of the data stack do you think should be more democratized versus more controlled? What features and processes can you build into tools that democratize data to maintain data reliability uh, and governance? Yeah, I, I love this question because the, the assumption that we always run into is that democratization and data quality or data reliability are gonna be in tension with one another. And I think that that is a, a natural assumption to make. Um, but if you look at the population of software engineers that exist today and push code to production applications, that has, I, I don't know what, oh, more than 10 X in the past 10 years. Um, and, and the way that that has happened is not that you uh, have like uh, very extremely tight controls on like who can push to production. What you do is you have mature CICD processes. You have like DevOps workflows that, so you like build these guardrails that create high quality processes around code releases to production where you have your cake and eat it too. You have democratization, you also have governance. All right. Um, 
one last one. It's sort of selfish. I'm enjoying this conversation so much. Like, I, I want to want it to keep going, but uh, I guess we're going to be at like 6.10 soon. Jack, do you want to pick the last one and then uh, we'll call it a night? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, a lot of pressure on the last one here. Let's make sure it's a good one. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. So uh, this is from Kyle to close this out. On the topic of automating business operations from the modern data stack, what do you think are the biggest challenges in making that shift from the current analytical focus? Gosh, I, I don't know. That's like beyond the event horizon. <laughs> um, it's, it's seriously, I think that there's like going to be kind of a singularity type event when like people start doing this thing more and there are going to be emails sent to large groups of people accidentally because somebody wrote a SQL query wrong. Like there's going to be all kinds of like bad things that happen, but like we have to like screw up to learn and, and, and improve. Um, so I just, I just don't, I don't think that we can know, but, but it feels very obvious to me that that must happen. Like, uh, it's not like the cycle of history goes towards like more manual processes like right. that. That's not how the world works. Yep. That's Jeremiah, anything, any final words to add there? Uh, I mean, I, I, I certainly agree. Um, when, when you think about businesses transitioning, I, I think that's the, the interesting, like thought provoking part of this is I think we very frequently see young companies just adopting it because it sort of makes sense. I think we see greenfield exercises moving into it. I, I think it's funny to think about like a business transitioning because like it's sort of hard to like migrations are really hard, especially when we're talking about, you know, such a, such a key piece of infrastructure. And so that's, that's the part that I'm sort of paused on right now is uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know how one would pitch that successfully. I think you would really, uh, I don't, I, I, I think it would not be an easy thing to like demonstrate in a large enterprise that you should just like switch. I think you would need to see the gradual adoption for new business uh, demonstrate an ROI. I mean, we have to like forget automating business processes. You'd have to use like business processes to demonstrate the value of this, which to those of us who have the, the luxury to pick and choose today, like this is no brainer. Like yeah. why in the world would you not choose the right tools to achieve your, your purposes here? But I, I think that's a challenging transition. I think that's the key word there. Yeah. hundred percent. Thank you. All right, folks, everyone. Um, we should probably call it night, as, as tempted as I am to keep going. Uh, but uh, look, this was uh, absolutely fantastic. Really uh, appreciate both of you uh, spending time with us and with this uh, community. Congratulations on all the success. Both of you guys are, um, you know, doing incredibly well and uh, are some of the uh, clearly emerging companies in in this space. Uh, Tristan, congrats again on the on the raise announcement today. Thank you. Uh, yeah. You know, excited for what comes in the you know in the roadmap and all the announcement for in the future weeks and months. Um, so that's it. That's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jack, and uh, thanks to everyone who attended this event. Uh, we'll have a, uh, a video soon in the next uh, few days or week. And uh, everyone, have a good night. And especially the international folks that uh, you know attended from Europe and. New Zealand. I don't even know what yeah. time it is there. Uh, <laughs> to uh, India as well. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who joined. Really Thanks. appreciate it. It's been fun. See you next time. Appreciate Jeremiah.